Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2012 with another Watchman video broadcast. I keep going back to certain places in the Bible because they just, they just jump out at you. Every time we see something going on, verses come to mind. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, listen to this verse. The thing that hath been is that which shall be. This is Solomon speaking. Solomon in his wisdom speaking the word of God. And he said, that which hath been is that which shall be. Here is hath been and here is shall be. And Solomon says, they're the same thing. Okay, And he said, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. So here is what's done. And here is what is shall be done. And there they are the same thing. There is no new thing. If there was an old time religion... You know, the old time mystery Babylon religion back, you know, 4,000 years ago. There's one now. If there was worship of a, of a sun god back then, there's worship of a sun god now. If there was worship of a fertility goddess who had a baby by the sun god, if that was worship back then, God says it's going to be worshiped in the last days. It's going to be that which is or that which shall be done. So somebody sent me, the, have you seen the cover of Time Magazine last week? Good grief. Now we actually have the PG version of this particular cover. We, we blotched, actually somebody did it for me. They said, Pastor Mike, look at this and then look at this. Now you're going to see, you're going to see in this graphic, that which was and that which shall be. The cover of Time Magazine featured a woman and what looks like a seven or eight year old son nursing from her. And it just matches perfectly this image of Isis nursing her son, Osiris. That which was is that which shall be. It just, just sort of, to me, it just sort of gives the impression that the old religion is a coming back. We're going to show you how that works. Now, last week we were dealing with uh, the Queen of Heaven. Mary, you remember that image? Mary sitting on the Ark of the covenant and I did that and I thought I was done with that subject and some more thoughts came to my mind actually this morning on the way over to our top secret broadcasting bunker it's a good thing I found it on the way over here this morning God is actually showing me more about this thing and I've been scribbling notes all morning where do you see what we know in fact others have helped me we, I actually had a lady write in to our ministry and she sent me a graphic of this and she sent me some other things too and she said Pastor Mike I grew up in a Masonic home she said I saw a lot of evil things she said I was a rainbow girl and the eastern star and all this stuff and she said I got saved and I realized that there's nothing right about that and she says I recognize some of the imagery that I saw on that graphic of Mary sitting on the Ark of the Covenant and she actually helped point me in the direction. And this is what I like about this ministry is that we have people all over the world that are watching stuff and they're going, Pastor Mike, have you seen this? Pastor Mike, look at this. And every now and then somebody will send me something that my jaw will just drop. And that's what happened to me this week and I'm going, you know what? I'm not done with this. I'm going to keep going with this because there was something in particular that she mentioned in her email that I am going to deal with. <clears throat> and it actually, it's kind of funny because the Vatican, no, let's see, the Virgin Mary has made the news this week. Did you see this article? Virgin Mary is the greatest source of hope for Europe's crisis. This is uh, from Valencia, Spain, May 15th, 2012. A top Vatican official called the Virgin Mary, quote, the greatest source of hope during the economic crisis now facing Spain and most of the countries of Europe. Uh, cardinal Antonio Canizares, during his homily, the cardinal said, devotion to Mary is especially important during the difficult times of our life amidst the great difficulties we are experiencing and as society faces a critical hour in history. In other words, yeah, the economy is going down the toilet and it's you know basically our fault because mankind is so greedy. Uh, so let's appeal to a higher power. Oh, no, not God or Jesus or nothing like that. Let's appeal to the Virgin Mary. We think that she can fix all of our problems. And so if there's any doubt in your mind that the Vatican is, the religion of the Vatican is solely centered upon one particular deity, and it's not Jehovah God, it's the Queen of Heaven. If there is any doubt in your mind, let there be no doubt in your mind whatsoever that Mary or excuse me, the Queen of Heaven is 
I, I want to keep saying the word worship. They say, we don't worship her. We pray to her, we offer incense to her, we bow to her, and we venerate her, but we don't worship her. That's the same thing, by the way. And so anyway, uh, Mary worship. Why is she so important? And what is it about her sitting on the Ark of the Covenant? And God reminded me of some verses and some things that I had read here a while back. If you remember this graphic, here was Mary, and she was sitting on the Ark of the Covenant. And there was an emblem there on the Ark of three things. The uh, Aaron's rod that budded, the, the bowl of manna and the, uh, the tables of testimony. In other words, the Ten Commandments on two tables of stone. I'm actually going to go to the scriptures, and we're going to find out what these symbolize. And it'll make sense, maybe in your mind, why she is sitting on them. And trust me when I say to you, this is going to bring in something, and this is what God showed me this morning on the way over here this morning. This is going to bring in Todd Bentley, Rick Joyner, the New Apostolic Reformation, the Kansas City Prophets, uh, the Pensacola Outpouring, uh, why, the, the ecumenical movement, the why, why, why the finances of the world are in the, are in the trash, and why there is a move to bring one global currency, one world government, one world... The dominion theology that Sarah Palin apparently believes in and buys into, the dominion theology that says we're the church, we're the woman, and we're going to bring, we're going to take dominion over the entire the entire world and hand it over to Jesus Christ when He comes, so He can rule and reign a thousand years. We're going to understand why all of this is working right now. When you see what I have to show you today, let's look at the book of Hebrews. I love Hebrews. Hebrews is actually giving you an explanation of what is inside the Ark of the Covenant. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4, the Bible says, "...which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid with, round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now particularly speak." And so I'm going to take these three items. We're going to see the biblical symbolism of them, what they represent in the Scriptures, and then we'll know, we'll understand why Mary is sitting on them. We'll, we'll understand that when we look at this. First, let's go to Numbers chapter 17. Here's the story, okay? The uh, elders of Israel. You know, Israel, they were always rebelling against something. As soon as God brought them out of Egypt, they started whining and moaning and complaining and murmuring. There was the gainsaying of Korah and God showed them. He swallowed them up. Okay, there was, there was other, th even Miriam and Aaron rebelled against Moses. And of course, uh, God afflicted her with uh, leprosy. And then we have this other thing going on here where God just needs to show his people about his election and about who is in charge. And so the Bible says, And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness. And behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of, uh, house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds, and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto all the children of Israel. And they looked, and took every man his rod. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony, to be kept for a token against the rebels. And thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me, that they die not. You see, all the elders, they brought, they brought a rod from each tribe. And here's Aaron's rod. And Moses laid them out before the Lord. The next day, I mean the very next day, Moses goes in and gets all the rods. Aaron's rod actually had sprouts, leaves. It had actually grown almonds. It had done this overnight. You know what this was to signify to Israel? It was God's election. God is the, and, and you've got to think about this. The Israelites going, oh, okay, we get it now. God is the only one who can make almonds grow on a rod overnight. And they knew that. They knew that. And so God was signifying unto Israel that when I elect somebody and when I choose somebody, I don't change my mind. You don't get to elect anybody. I am the one who chooses these things. It's like God showing, I'm in charge here. I want you to get this. God is saying, I am the one in charge here. And I've selected the tribe of Levi to be the priest. That's my decision to make. I'm the one in charge. Think about now, think about the Virgin Mary, the Queen of Heaven, sitting on that. 
Okay, I want you to understand that. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 11, here's another mentioning of that rod. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, I want you to look at that, the word of the Lord. Okay, I want you to look at that. The word of the Lord came unto me saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And, he, and I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, thou hast well seen. I want you to look at what God said, for I will hasten my word to perform it. So here we have the rod of an almond tree. And it's a symbol of God hastening his word. I want you to think about this idea of the word or God's word. Uh, when we look into the sanctuary in Ezekiel chapter 25, we have the, we have the menorah. You have the uh, table of showbread on the north. You have the most holy place on the west where the Ark of the Covenant is. And on the south, you have the menorah. You have the, you have the seven candlesticks there. And there are like bowls that they would pour oil into every day. And this oil is what fed the light of the candles. That's how they stayed lit. So the light represents, think about uh, what David said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The only light in the sanctuary was from those seven candlesticks that were fed by this oil by these bowls. Look at how God described these were to be made. Ezekiel chapter 25 verse 33. Three bowls made like unto almonds with a knop and a flower in one branch and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knop and a flower. So in the six branches it came out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like an almonds with their knops and their flowers. And so I want you to understand this, this oil and the container of this. I want you to look at this. This is the container of the oil that shines the light into, into a very, very dark world, but it shines the light into the hearts of God's people. So we're, we're looking at this idea, the symbolism that it's related to the word of God. Isaiah chapter 11, it specifically mentions a rod. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now I want to stop right here. Aaron's rod that budded was a symbol of Jesus Christ, and God, he is God's chosen one. He is God's elect one. And then I want you to notice in verse 2, here we have, now remember, the, the, the candlesticks was seven. That represents, in the book of Revelation, we see that that represents the seven spirits of God. And they're fed by these little almond bowl, you know, things that feed the oil. You look back in Isaiah chapter 11, and here we have a listing of the seven spirits of God. We have the rod, we have the branch, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. And so here we have the seven spirits of God uh, coming forth out of the rod. We have the, we have the seven lamps in the, in the menorah. We have the almond-shaped bowls that feed oil to that. We have Aaron's rod that budded that symbolizes God's hastening of his word, and it symbolizes God's election. Now, I want you to think about this. We're going to try to tie some things together. And this number seven, you have the seven spirits of God. You have the seven candlesticks. Psalm chapter 12, verse 6 and 7 Psalm 12 is the 490th chapter of the Bible. You know what that is? That's 70 times 7. Okay? I didn't put it there. It's just there. All right? Uh, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified. Look at there. Seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So here we have this rod that budded. It's a symbol of, uh, there are different ideas about a rod, a rod of correction, that's the Bible, the rod, Jesus Christ being the rod, he is the word of God. So I want you to understand this symbolism of why it's in the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle itself represents uh, the body of the believer. And at the very heart, at the very core of every Christian is Aaron's rod that budded a representation of the Lord Jesus and a representation of his word. Now let's look at the pot of manna. This is where it gets more interesting. I like this. The pot of manna. The manna shows up in Exodus chapter 16. Now that just happens to be, here again, that just happens to be the 66th chapter of the Bible. That is the exact number of books that are in the Bible. Now I want you to notice, I want you to notice what God says here. Ezekiel, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from you. He said he'll rain bread from you. Rain. Think about that. Uh, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. 
In Deuteronomy chapter 32, notice what the Bible says about rain. I love this. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, and my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. Publish, as in a book. I love it. Okay, So when God rained the bread down from heaven, that was a symbol. What, what does God rain down from heaven? He rains his doctrine. He rains his word, his speech, laying on the ground as the dew. We go back to Exodus chapter 16, verse 13. The Bible says, And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning... The dew, look at there, the dew lay round about the host, and when the dew that would lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. So here, and, that's, and that was manna. Look at verse 15. When the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. We look at verse 31. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, the seed, the Bible says the seed is the word, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. So I want you to understand this. The, the manna that comes down is a picture of God's word coming down from heaven to mankind. In other words, God didn't just have his whole doctrine and all of his ideas up in heaven where nobody can get to it. What did he tell Israel? He said, it's not up in heaven where you would say, we need to send somebody up there to go get it. God said, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. Paul said, the word of faith, which we preach. And so this idea of manna coming down from heaven, being on the ground, the Israelites eating it, it's a picture of a Christian who consumes his Bible daily. He reads his Bible and he feeds his soul with the manna from God. And they called it, I love this, they called it manna. You know, the Hebrew word manna means, what is that? I mean, it's, that's what it is. They go, manna? Okay, they can't figure out what it is. That's because they're partially blinded. They don't understand. Jesus then comes to them. John chapter 6. Look at what Jesus said. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And then we look in verse 48 of the same chapter. Jesus said, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And that bread not only symbolizes Jesus Christ, but it symbolizes the word the doctrine, the words, the speech of God coming down from heaven. Jesus, the, the Hebrew starts out, God who at sundry times and in a diverse manner spake unto us uh, by, by the prophets, hath now in these last days spoken to us by his Son. And that hit the Son of God is the Word of God. Revelation 19 says that. John chapter 1 verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 1 John chapter 5 verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So we have, we have Aaron's rod that budded, a symbol of Jesus Christ, uh, and a representation of the seven spirits of God. We have the pot of manna, which represents Jesus Christ, represents the Word of God. The Bible. Are you getting where I'm going with this so far? Why is, why is the Queen of Heaven sitting on them? We'll find out. Then we have the tables of stone, Exodus chapter 32. Think about now, think about the tables of stone. Here we have uh, tablets made out of stone. God took his finger and went and wrote. I don't know that they sounded just like that, but you know, okay, use your imagination. Okay, or maybe we'll bring it into the 21st century. Zzz, 
something like that. God wrote, God actually wrote in words, in words that people could read his word, his law. The Ten Commandments coming down from heaven are the first version of the written word of God. And they're written, they're written on stone. Do you know why? Because once you write in stone, you can't take it away. And I want you to, in fact, let's look at this. Exodus chapter 32, verse 15. Moses turned, went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, and on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. You see, here's the idea. God wrote, God wrote on, uh, on stone, number one, because you can't take away from it. And then it says that he wrote it on both sides. Why? There's no room to add anything to it. I, I, God's pretty neat. I like that. Okay, so here comes Moses now with these two tables in his hand. He's a picture of something. By the way, these are the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are first found in Exodus chapter 20. Exodus, remember, Exodus 16 is the 66th chapter of the Bible. Exodus chapter 20 is the 70th chapter of the Bible. Let's break those two numbers down. We have 7 and 10. 7 represents perfection or completion. When God wrote them on the stone, they're perfect. They're complete. You don't add to or take away from them. The number 10 represents the number 4 dominion. When you, have, when you have 10 toes, when you have feet and you're standing on something, your 10 toes have dominion over that. God told Joshua, every place the soles of your feet touch, that will I give you. So he has dominion over it. The, the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw with the 10 toes, they were 10 kings. They had dominion over the earth. So the law... Uh, the book of Romans says that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. So here we have, in the 70th chapter of the Bible, we have the number 7 for perfection, we have the number 10 for dominion, and we have the Ten Commandments in this particular chapter. Now that's interesting, because the word king in the King James Bible, with a capital K, is mentioned exactly 70 times in 66 verses. In fact, here is a, a screen capture of what I see when I look for words or phrases in the Bible. You will see that the word king with a capital K exactly 70 times in 66 verses. I just think that's neat. Okay, uh, Revelation chapter 5 now. Here's Moses coming down. He's got the, he's got the book in his hand. Revelation chapter 5, And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with, how many seals? Seven. Oh, I just absolutely love this. So here's Moses. He's got the two tables of testimony in his hand. It's the word of God. Here is God in heaven. In his right hand, he has a book written within and on the back side, just like the Ten Commandments. And they're sealed with seven seals. There's another picture of the Holy Spirit again. It's sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, the Bible says. And this is interesting because the word book or books in the King James Bible, here's the graphic, is 196 times in the King James Bible. You know what that is? That's 49 times 4 or 7 times 7 times 4. It gets better than that. Here we have, here's another screen capture, the phrase, the exact phrase, Jesus Christ 196 times in the King James Bible, 49 times 4. The exact phrase, Son of Man, 196 times in the King James Bible. That's 49 times 4. Now, let me, let me kind of tell you where I'm going with this, okay? Here we have Aaron's rod that budded, a picture of Christ, and, and it's got the seven spirits of God, the seven seals, and the lights in the, in the uh, tabernacle and so on. It's the light of the world. It's the Bible. Here we have the pot of manna, which is God rained down from heaven. It's a picture of Christ. It's a picture of his doctrine. It's a picture of his word given to us in the 66th chapter of the Bible, 66 books in the Bible. And then we have the Ten Commandments. Again, another picture of the written word of God, which came down from the mountain, came down from heaven, and was given to mankind. So I want you to get where I'm going with this, okay? In the Ark of the Covenant, you have all these representations of Christ and the Bible. There's the graphic there. And then we have Mary sitting on them. Why is Mary sitting on them? 
Why is she on them? I want you to th think about something. If, if, if you and I were wrestling, okay? We used to wrestle a lot when we were kids. If you and I were wrestling, okay? And, um, and I got the best of you, and I had you down on the ground, and all 300 pounds of me was laying on top of you, I win. I'm in charge, okay? My sister used to do that. She was a little bit older than me and a little bit bigger than me, okay? Uh, when we were kids, mind you. And uh, she, used to, she used to get the best of me out in the backyard, and she would be on me, and she'd say, now, who's boss? Uh, you are, sis. Okay, that's how it is. See, when you're on something, the earth is his footstool, the Bible says. God reigns over the earth. Um, 1 Corinthians 15 says, God is going to put all of the enemies of Christ where? Under his feet. When something is under your feet, when you're on something, you own it. Okay? You've got it. It's yours. I want you to think about that. Let's get back to this woman here. Okay? In fact, I'm going to do what I did last week. I'm just going to keep, keep her close by and I'm going to keep referencing her. Here she is. Um, the sun and the moon, and she's clothed in scarlet. Let's go back at the Bible and look at what it says. Revelation chapter 17. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. I want you to think about that. Though your sins be as scarlet. Okay? Uh, the man of sin. He's a scarlet colored beast. So scarlet is the number, is the, uh, excuse me, the color for sin. Uh, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Uh, I want you to notice that word filthiness. Okay, She is an unclean woman. She is filthy. She's dirty. She is unclean. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Harlots are just not, they're not clean people. Okay, Mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And then I want you to notice verse, seven, or excuse me, verse 9 of chapter 17. This is something really interesting. Here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads, talking about the seven heads of the beast. The seven heads are seven mountains, don't you look at this, on which the woman sitteth. Now, a lot of people, you know, make the analogy, well, Rome has seven hills and uh, Mount Vaticanus is one of those hills. And, and, and yeah, okay, I get that, okay? But I want you to look at something uh, just a, a, a little bit bigger than that. Here we have uh, an unclean woman, a filthy woman. And she's sitting on these mountains. Okay, I want you to kind of get that in your mind. She is unclean, and she is sitting on these mountains. There's actually a law. There's a law in the Old Testament that pertains to an unclean woman and, what, and how she makes things around her unclean. Leviticus chapter 15, verse 25. And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. Every bed wherein she lieth all the days of her issue shall be under her as the bed of her separation. And I want you to notice this. And whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her separation. Whatsoever she sitteth upon, she's made unclean. Now, let me try to use G-rated language to describe this. Okay, this is, going to get, this is going to get a little weird. We've covered this topic before. It's actually uh, Dan Brown mentioned it in um, uh, the Da Vinci Code. And we've, we've covered this topic. We've covered this idea or this symbolism. In fact, let me go ahead and show you this. Here is, a, here is a symbol, and this is really interesting. Don't know quite what it means yet, but here's a symbol. Of course, we have the woman, uh, the Virgin Mary, and she is inside what looks like an oval shape. This is actually called the mandorla. Now, something that to me is really, really interesting. Mandorla is an Italian word. It's an Italian word for almond. I don't know quite the relationship yet because that just occurred to me. But here we have this almond-shaped symbol. And you've seen it all over the place, and we're going to show you different representations of it, okay? Because I want you to understand this. When we have, when, in this particular law, when a woman's unclean, it refers, to her, it refers to her monthly cycle, okay? And this refers to um, her reproductive part, the reproductive part of a woman's body, 
okay, is what we're dealing with here. That is unclean, and it had to be washed and so on. And that's why God said, in the law, any place where she sits because of her uncleanness is dirty, it's defiled, it's unclean. So here we have Mary sitting on the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God, but she's sitting upon these images and, and emblems of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. And so I want you to, um, I want you to, th boy, I hate to even go this direction. This image here of the Mandorla, I want you to put this back up on the screen. I want to show you this, okay? This image of the Mandorla is actually, and I want you to, I want you to take a look at this now, okay? It's going to have it up on the screen. This image of the Mandorla and the image of the woman in this particular picture here is actually, and, and I'm just going to say this, it's an anatomically correct emblem of a woman's reproductive organ, with, without actually coming out and saying, this is a, okay, this is an anatomically correct image of the channel of birth, or the channel of a woman's reproductive part. It's the part of her that's unclean while she has, or is going through her cycle that needs to be clean. Do you understand what I'm getting at here? Okay, because as I mentioned a while ago, it's the channel of it's the channel of uncleanness, or it's the channel of birth. You see this image on uh, Catholic churches, even some Protestant churches all over the place. Uh, here it is in the form of a window, and you just stop and think about what this now represents. It represents what what uh, Dan Brown referred to in the Da Vinci Code as the sacred feminine. It's uh, the the woman is worshipped because of her ability to produce life or to bring forth life okay so you have a you have a harlot woman and a harlot church and this symbol is a symbol not only of birth but of reproduction but it's a symbol of uncleanness and i want you to uh here's a here's another image of um you see it in the catholic church here is a here's a graphic now of the front of a Catholic church. These were these Gothic cathedrals. These Gothic cathedrals were built, and here's another, here's a better image of it here. Okay? Now remember that this Mandorla image is an image of the sacred feminine. I want you to, I want you to understand this. Okay? Try to use G-rated language here. Okay? Uh, the, the, um, the stonemasons, the Knights Templar actually designed these Gothic cathedrals all over Europe and that spread out into all over the world, these Catholic churches that are built like this. Okay? The entire Catholic church is meant to represent the woman. It's, and that's why they call it the mother church. And it's interesting that in Catholic doctrine, there's not anything, there's not anything that a Catholic priest does that he needs to do inside the Catholic church. When they have a funeral, you have to have it at the Catholic church. When you get married, you have to get married in the church. When you have communion, you have to, I mean, everything has to involve the physical building of the church. Why? Because of the symbolism of it. The Catholic church actually represents the womb. So I want you to get this, okay? You go into the doorway, the entryway of the womb, the Catholic Church. You have a little ritual performed on you. You eat the cookie and drink the blood, and oh, you bow to the image of Mary in there. Okay. And the idea is, is that when you come back out this door, you're reborn. Okay. That's that's what this represents. Okay. Um, the here's here's another one here, and I just saw this, and when when I, it just really occurred to me what this was. This is the image of Mary of Guadalupe. Now, according to the story, I don't remember how long ago, uh, a Mexican peasant went up on a hillside. He saw a vision of Mary. Uh, he went into a trance. When he woke up, there was this blanket or this tapestry or something like that that was covering him, and it had this image. It like supposedly came from heaven or something like that. It had this it had this image. I want you to look at this, okay? And I'm I'm looking at this image one day and it occurred to me what it was I was looking at. I was looking at an anatomically correct image of the reproductive part of a woman and it represents represents her uncleanness is what it represents. Catholics all over the world bow and they worship this. Okay? 
This is why I'm not a Catholic. I, I, this is not right. It's, it, you say, Pastor Mike, that's vulgar. Absolutely it's vulgar. I didn't, I'm not the one that came up with it. People worship this thing, and this is their religion. It's a religion of vulgarity, and it's a religion of harlotry. Now, would you understand this? Let's get back to our picture here. Okay, This is an unclean woman, and she is sitting on something. And according to law, whatever she sits on now is defiled. It's corrupt. It's unclean. It's, it can't be used. It's no good. Okay, So I want you to see that. There is actually a story of this. Actually, a story of this in the Bible. Okay, you remember uh, Jacob marrying his two wives, Rachel and Leah. Okay, and R Jacob leaves with Rachel and Leah and and uh, the concubines and all the children, and uh, Laban comes out after him because one of them stole Laban's idols, his images. Okay, stole his gods. I want you to think about that. And uh, Laban shows up and says, "Hey." Somebody's got my images here and I don't appreciate it. And then Jacob said, well, I'll tell you what, none of my clan took it. And if you find it in here, you have, my, you have my permission to kill whoever took it. So he's searching through the tents and everything. Well, guess who took it? It was Rachel, his, his really beloved daughter, Rachel. And she knows that she's fixing to be caught. So you know what she does? Genesis chapter 31, verse 33. Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the two maidservants' tents, but he found them not. Then went he in, out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the images and put them in the camel's furniture, and look at what she did. And sat upon them. Laban searched all the tent, but found them not. And she said to her father, Let it not displease my lord that I cannot rise up before thee. For the custom of women is upon me, and he searched but found not the image. You know what she's saying? She's sitting on this camel's furniture that she has buried, she has secreted, she has hidden this false god, and she's sitting on it, and she says, Dad, I, I can't get up because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the woman's way. I can't get up. You know, what, you know what you're seeing here? She has defiled what she's sitting on. There's a picture of it right here. Okay? So back to this image now of the Queen of Heaven sitting on the, not, not just the Ark of the Covenant, sitting on the pot of manna, the rod of an almond tree, and the two tables of stone. She's sitting on and defiling the Bible, the Word of God. She is defiling the God's word, his doctrine, his scripture. You stop and think about now the symbol is that it all makes sense. Roman Catholicism is all about defilement and corruption of the word of God. Rome hates, listen to this, Rome hates the King James Bible. The Vatican does. They hate this book. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Let's look at some scripture. Job chapter 14, verse 4. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as what? Filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And I want you to notice the language of the scripture, what it's describing here. Here we have a, an unclean woman because of her cycle. And everything that she uses and everything that she touches during that time is unclean. And here God is described. Stop and think about this. The Vatican, the Catholic Church is all about if you perform these deeds, then you can receive communion. Or if you do this, then you can have your sins atoned for. God spelled it out right there. He spelled it out that those righteous deeds that Roman Catholic, that anybody else for that matter thinks that they're doing, they're filthy rags. Okay? You think about it. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 25. There is conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof like a roaring lion ravening the prey. Where have you heard that from before? They have devoured souls. Look at this. They have taken the treasure and precious things. Stop right here. Do you know what the treasure and the precious things are? It's that. Okay? That's the treasure of the house of the Lord. They have taken the treasure and the precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests... 
have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane, neither have they showed difference between the clean and the unclean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoke, spoken. You know what that is, don't you? He's talking about the priests and the prophets. You know the prophets are the, the Roman Catholic Church? It's the Pope. They sit in the, the, in the apostle's seat, and whatever they say is Catholic doctrine. Whatever the Pope says is Catholic doctrine. It doesn't matter if the Bible contradicts it. It's just whatever the Pope says. This verse is speaking directly about the Vatican. They've taken the treasure, they have profaned the holy things, and they have made them unclean. Psalm chapter 106, verse 38. And shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was, look at this, polluted with blood. Now think about this unclean woman. And she is in the pollution of her blood. Lamentations 4.14. They have wandered as blind men in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood. Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 22. My face will I turn also from them, and they shall pollute my what? My secret place, for the robber shall enter it and to defile it. They shall pollute my secret place. You know what was in the secret place? The Ark of the Covenant. And here God in Ezekiel is talking about they polluted. They made it unclean. She, sitting on the Ark of the Covenant, defiled the ark and everything that was in it. Daniel chapter 11 verse 31, and the and arms shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 22, ye shall defile also the covering of thy graven images of silver and the ornament of thy molten images of gold. Thou shalt cast them away. Looky here. Looky here. Thou shalt cast them away as a menstruous cloth and shalt say unto it, get thee hence. Do you know what God's saying? That this, these idols of gold are like a menstruous cloth. Think about it. A woman, an unclean woman, in her cycle, she is unclean and everything that she sits on is unclean and she's defiled everything in the pollution of her blood. And God said, it's just like a graven image of gold. It's just like a menstruous cloth. This Bible is amazing. This Bible, absolutely, I've, I've had more fun digging this out this week. Praise the Lord. Lamentations chapter 1 verse 17. Zion spreadeth forth her hands, and there is none to comfort her. The Lord hath commanded concerning Jacob that his adversaries should be round about him. Jerusalem, look at here, is as a menstruous woman among them. Isaiah 64, verse 6, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And then we are back to Revelation 17, 4. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations, and look at here, filthiness of her fornication. See, it kind of makes sense now, doesn't it? Okay? That which was is that which shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. God is accurately describing exactly what's up with the symbolism of Mary, the Queen of Heaven, Isis, the whore, the fertility goddess, and her all men, okay, sitting on and defiling not only, listen to this, not only the Ark of the Covenant, but the, table, the, uh, the pot of manna, the rod of Aaron, and the Ten Commandments. She has defiled, she has corrupted those things. I'm, I'm going to show you what this looks like. Okay, Here is, according to this, is not my cogatology. This is, thus saith the Lord. This is the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. This Bible is incorruptible. It has no corruption in it whatsoever. You know how I know that? It says it. 
It says that it's incorruptible. It, this Bible actually says that there are no mistakes in this book. There are zero mistakes in this book. It's what this book says. I believe what this book, if some, if some man, I, uh, Mike, I'm an esteemed scholar. I've studied Greek, I've studied Hebrew, and I've studied manuscripts, and I'm telling you that there are all kinds of errors in this Bible. I'm going to say, no, there's not. Oh, yes, there is. And I'm going to say, no, there's not. Oh, yes, there is. And I'm going to say, no, there's not. Because let God be true, and every man a liar. So this is, this is the incorruptible Word of God. And so I believe, I believe that every word in here is right, and I don't have a right to change it. This is the King James Bible. This is the new King James Bible. You remember Jack Van Impey? We talked about Jack Van Impey last week. Jack Van Impey, you, I mean, he's Mr. Prophecy. Jack Van Impey had memorized, I couldn't, I, I don't know, hundreds or even thousands of verses out of the King James Bible, memorized them by heart, could quote them one after another. And then something happened to him and he just went off stupid back in the 90s and he said, Pope John Paul II, oh, he's a great man of God, great Christian, great man of the faith of God. Pope John Paul II was a Mary worshiper. He was an idolater. And so now Jack Van Impey, on his, show, on his show, says, this is the Word of God. And he's using the New King James Bible with this Triketra symbol on it. This is the Word of God. It's what he says. No, because this changes what this said. They're not the same book. And you know how I know? Because when, uh, who was it, Thomas Nelson? Yeah, uh, when uh, Thomas Nelson put this together, they had to, want, had to copyright it. You can only copyright it if it's significantly different from what it's based on. And they said, oh yeah, we've got <laughs> thousands of differences in here. So they said, okay, you can have a copyright on it, and they copyrighted it. And they're telling the world this is significantly different than what it's based on. You know what? She corrupted it. She sat on it. She defiled it. And she corrupted it. That's what happens. And what is this based on? Let me give you a little lesson here, okay? King James Bible. Based upon, the, I, think, I think it's called the Masoretic Text of the Old Testament. And based upon the Textus Receptus of the New Testament, which is based upon the majority of the Greek manuscripts that we have out there. Okay? I'm not an expert in text. This is what little bit I know. Okay, now, uh, we have... Um, we have all these new Bibles here. Let me get my NIV, okay? my non-inspired version here. Okay? We have my non-inspired version with whole verses missing. Okay, We'll talk about that. And both of these Bibles were actually, they represented a departure. Whereas the King James and the, um, the Geneva and the Bishops and the Tyndale and the Wycliffe and uh, Martin Luther's and all of these other versions before the King James were actually based upon one particular group of manuscripts that had been preserved for thousands of years through the, through the priesthood of the Old Testament or the priesthood of the believers in the New Testament. Uh, these versions and the Mess Edge Bible and the Holman Standard and um, the, um, the New English Version, the Common English Version and all the other perversions of the Bible, they actually represented a departure from basing, even the New King James, represented a departure from basing themselves upon the same manuscripts that the King James was based upon. They went a different direction. They actually based themselves upon two primary Greek documents. One of them was called, you're going to like this, Vaticanus. You know why it was called Vaticanus? Because the Vaticanuses have it. It's in the Vatican. It's in the Vatican Library. They, they don't let very many people see this thing. In fact, most people, even most scholars that have examined the Vaticanus, have never seen the original document and they've never seen the complete document. There's parts of it that the Vatican will never let human eyes rest upon. Never let them do it. Here is where the Vaticanus came from. Now, this is from, this is not from Gail Rippinger. This is not from uh, anybody else. This is from Wikipedia. Okay, you don't like that. This is the source of information. You don't like it? I can't help it. But here's what, here's what Wikipedia said. Okay, uh, they said concerning the Vaticanus, you can look this up. It was at that point that scholars realized the text of the Vaticanus differed uh, differed from the Vulgate and the Textus Receptus. So here we have, 
Here we have the Vaticanus, okay? Well, I'm just, I like playing with pictures today. Here we have the Vaticanus, okay? And according to Wikipedia, Wikipedia said that the Vaticanus is significantly different than what the Textus Receptus was based upon, okay? Then it goes on to say, current scholarship considers the Codex Vaticanus to be one of the best Greek texts of the New Testament, with that of the Codex Sinaiticus. We're going to talk about that in a minute. As its only competitor, until the discovery by Tischendorf of the Sinaiticus text, the Codex was unrivaled. It was extensively used by, here we go, Westcott and Hort, and their edition of the New Testament in the original Greek in 1881. Those, the most widely sold editions of the Greek New Testament are largely based on the text of the Codex Vaticanus. So, the, the new Greek text that are floating out there, Metzger's and uh, the Nestle Alon text, and I don't know how many of them there are out there, they are primarily based upon, and the versions now that come out of them, are primarily based upon the Vaticanus document. The one that is owned by the Vatican. That's where they came from. And we have two guys named Westcott and Hort. Let me give you a little history here. Westcott and Hort uh, were commissioned by the King of England because the King thought that maybe we ought to update some of the language of the King James. And only the King had a right to do that because, remember, it was under a royal letters patent. And nobody but the King could commission this. So he said, Westcott and Hort, you're the two guys. We want you to handle this. And they said, <laughs> So you know what they did? They decided not to just update the language of the King James. They said, we're going to go a completely different route. Because the King James is best based upon the Texas Receptus, and we don't like it. We're going to go with the Vatican Greek text. And they decided that they couldn't just revise the King James. So they came up with a completely new Bible called the Revised Standard Version, the RSV. That's what they came up with. That was their baby. And every, every Bible that has been produced that does not stem from the Textus Receptus or the King James line comes from Westcott and Hort, who got it from the Vaticanus. Then we have the Sinaiticus. And here is, an, again, here is, uh, uh, the, the Sinaiticus was found in a trash can in a monastery in Mount Sinai. The monks had it, threw it away. Tischendorf found it back in the 1800s, and he went, oh, look at this, okay? Here's what Wikipedia says. According to Tischendorf, Codex Sinaiticus was one of the 50 copies of the Bible commissioned from Eusebius by Roman Emperor Constantine after his conversion uh, to Christ. Now, let me, let me just kind of explain what this is, okay? Do you remember when you got saved? I remember when I got saved. I got saved because, man, I tell you what, I realized that I was going to hell. I was going to burn in hell forever. And I got down on an altar and I said, God, you saved my soul. I was nine years old. Okay. Do you remember when you got saved? You got saved because the crushing weight of your sin was condemning you and you knew you were headed for hell and you said, God save me. That's not how Constantine got saved. Const you know how Constantine excuse me, converted to Christianity? He was a pagan. He was a pagan. You know how he got converted? He saw a sign up in the heaven. He saw a symbol of the Cairo, this, this ancient symbol. He saw that up there. And, and, and he saw writing underneath it that said, In this sign, conquer. And he said, oh, That looks like a cross. I think I'm a Christian now. I think God wants me to conquer the world. And that's how he became. And so he said, uh, That statue, statue of Jupiter, that's St. Peter now. That's what he did. He, he converted everything from pagan names to quote-unquote Christian names. Constantine was not a born-again Christian. But now, at this point now, the religion of Rome is his religion. And he orders 50 copies of the Bible to be, to be written up in Greek. Okay? He's 50 copies. Eusebius is in charge of this. And so here's what happens. Already, because Paul said, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Already in Paul's day, there were people, the Gnostics, they were taking these, these Greek manuscripts that had been written, that, that had been floating around, and they were looking at that and they were going, you know what, we don't, we don't like that. Because we don't believe that Jesus is God, and we don't believe anything like that. And so you know what they did? 
they started taking things out. They started e eliminating things out of these. And the 50 texts that Eusebius had drawn up for Constantine matched what the Gnostics believed. They didn't believe that Jesus was God. You want proof of that? Go read 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And that verse is missing out of, out of the Sinaiticus, out of the Vaticanus, and it just happens to be missing out of all these Bibles too. Acts chapter 8, verse 37. Here's Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch says, What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said in Acts chapter 8, verse 37, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And so then they went, that verse is missing out of the Vaticanus, out of the Sinaiticus, and thus out of these Bibles. Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. Mark chapter 9, verse 29. You know what those are? Those are the two verses in the Bible where Jesus said, This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. In fact, they're the only two places in the whole Bible where that's mentioned. The only two places in the King James. In fact, I'm gonna have, I got a graphic up here for you. You're going to like this. This is, this is what I see. This is a screen capture. And when I look at Matthew chapter 17, verse 21, in the King James, it's on the left, how, how be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. I want you to look there at the empty slot where the NIV is. It's gone. She sat on them and she corrupted them. She defiled them. Now it's gone from being... Think about this. In the Ark of the Covenant was a bowl of manna. Now, if you go back and look at the Old Testament, you'll see that when the Israelites gathered manna every day, if they gathered too much, you know what happened to it the next day? It went away. It corrupted. It turned into rot. When they gathered uh, uh, enough on the, on the sixth day for the Sabbath day, if they had any left over, you know what happened to it? It corrupted. It rotted. You know what happened when they put a bowl of manna in the Ark of the Covenant? It was preserved. It was incorruptible. Same way with the rods. Same way with the two tables of stone. They were incorruptible. They were undefiled. And so now we have the Queen of Heaven and her uncleanness and the filthiness of her issue. And she's defiled all of them. All of these new Bibles and all the corruption that's coming not only out of the verses, but the doctrines that are coming out of these new Bibles and the new things that are coming on, they're all to be laid at the feet of the Vatican because she is the one that defiled them. This uh, came out of Jack Chick's website, for, uh, his uh, newsletter called Battle Cry. Uh, this is an all came out this month. Vatican now trying to steal the KJV. Um, and here's a quote, if it had not been for the Catholics of the 1500s, there would be no King James Bible. If it were possible, 60 million corpses would be turning over in their graves in response to the arrogance of this lie. Kerry Summers, organizer of a recent Bible exhibit in the Vatican, is quoted by the Catholic News Agency during a CNA tour of the display. Summers goes on to explain many of the original Bibles that formed the basis of the King James Bible came from Catholic priests. Are you kidding me? You know, what she's, you know what they're trying to say? Watch this now. Remember? This, by, by, by the way, this is not her throne. She has no business there. It's not her. She has no business sitting on and ruling over the Word of God. She has no business with that. Now the Vatican comes out and says, that, oh, that King James Bible? Yeah, that was us. Yeah, you, have you seen their commercials? The Vatican's putting out commercials in America going, the Catholic Church... We actually formed the Bible. That was our work. We did that. No, she didn't. Now she start now, watch this, okay? King James in sixteen oh four gathered these scholars together. The Vatican tried to get that thing broken up. They tried to stop that Bible from being translated and produced. And they've been working against this Bible ever since. Westcott and Hort come up. Yeah, let's get people away. King James is the only Bible in English. West Cart and Hort show up, and the train starts rolling of all the other translations that are pulling everybody in the church away from the incorruptible Word of God. And now we have the Vatican. We have the Vatican in their gall showing up and saying, Oh, the King James, you like that? That was us. Yeah, we, the, most of the documents that it was based upon, we wrote them. Yeah. 
And then there's this article uh, came out in 2005, Catholic Church No Longer Swears by the Truth of the Bible. The hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church has published a teaching document instructing the faithful that some parts of the Bible are not accurate, actually true. Catholic bishops of England, Wales, and Scotland are warning their five million worshipers, as well as any others drawn to the study of the Scripture, that they should not expect total accuracy from the Bible. We should not expect to find in Scripture full scientific accuracy or complete historical precision, they say in the gift of Scripture. The document is timely, coming as it does amid the rise of, of the religious right, in particular in the U.S., the article goes on to say, in the document, the bishops acknowledge their debt to biblical scholars. They say the Bible must be approached in the knowledge that it is God's word expressed in human language and that proper acknowledgement should be given both to the word of God and its human dimensions. Okay, um, They say the church must offer the gospel in ways appropriate to changing times. Then they say we should not expect total accuracy from the Bible in other secular matters. They go on to condemn fundamentalism for its intransigent intolerance and to warn of significant dangers involved in a fundamentalist approach. She's defiled it. The Vatican, she... The Queen of Heaven has issued a statement saying, the Bible is, is so corrupt. You shouldn't believe everything that it says. However, when the Pope comes in and he listens to me, he, what he says is true. Everything that he says is true. She truly is sitting on and thus defiling the very Word of God. And she's sitting on the throne. Somebody sent me. They said, Pastor Mike, you got to look at this. Look at this graphic again. And I want you to notice uh, the symbolism of Mary and her two arms coming down. And I want you to notice the sun. That was the monstrance. And I want you to notice here the crescent moon. I want you to take a good look at that because she said, Pastor Mike, I grew up in a Masonic home. And she said, I know Mason symbols. And she said, when I saw that image, that's exactly what I saw. Let me show you this. Here's the image of the square and compass. You get it? You get it? Okay. What she's doing here is showing... The Masonic emblem of the square and compass, including the sun in the middle. Here's another one. This is a, like a Masonic uh, uh, engraving or something like that. The square and the compass. Notice the semicircle shape of the crescent moon with the sun in the middle of it. That's the Virgin Mary. And, and oh, you're going to like this. Okay. Somebody else sent me this one. They said, Pastor Mike, here's the Virgin Mary doing this. And she's got this big thing in her chest. Doesn't that look an awful lot like the all-seeing eye on the capstone, which is the all-seeing eye of Horus? In fact, here we're going to superimpose one over the other. You see then that the all-seeing eye in the capstone is a perfect representation of the Virgin Mary here with her arms outstretched and that thing in the middle. Then, then, and I'm just going, man, we got watchers. They're watching this stuff. And then it dawned on me. I went, look at there. Okay. Here we have, here we have, look back here at this image. We have Mary with the sun in her chest. And then we have the crescent moon and her hands going over, just like the square and compass. They, they're fused together. I've seen that before. The symbol of the sun is the symbol for the god, the sun god. The symbol for the moon is the symbol for the goddess or the fertility goddess. Remember what her symbol is. So you have the, the opposites, the sons of God, the daughters of men, or you have the angelic realm and the human realm fused together. That's what made, here is the symbols of Jacob and Boaz. Look at it. You have the two pillars of Jacob and Boaz, and one has the sun over it. One has the crescent moon over it. And notice that they are fused together at a center point, potter and modder, uh, superior and inferior. That's the emblem. What, here, what Mary is doing here is showing you the secret of Nebuchadnezzar's vision in Daniel chapter 2. They shall mingle themselves. And you know what the Ark of the Covenant represents? It represents the X chromosomes where the DNA is stored. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men in man's own DNA. And by the way, let me, let me, let me get back to this. Okay? When you take two circles, the sun and the moon, and you fuse them together like that, you know what emblem it creates in the center? There's that mandorla again. That's her. That's her symbol. Okay? Now, here's what God showed me on the way over here. This is why this has really got me going. 
And a lot of this stuff now, I've dropped my pen, a lot of this stuff makes sense now of what's going on in the world. Why are we all going to one, one currency? Why are we all going to one government? Why are we all going to one religion? Why is everybody trying to be gone? One language, one la this and that and the other. Remember the teaching from the missing piece. Why is it that it just seems like all of the Christian denominations and Christian ministries are trying to bring all the Christians together as one so we can defeat Satan together and we can bring in the we can take dominion and hand over the kingdom to Jesus Christ. You see, get this idea. Rick Joyner, Todd Bentley, the New Apostolic Reformation, the Kansas City Prophets, the Manifest Sons of God, the Charismatics, the Benny Hinn, they all are part and parcel of the same the Mormon church and Mitt Romney or like the, and Glenn Beck. They all have the same idea as the Vatican. Let's take over the entire world, but not for us. Let's take it over so we can give it to Jesus so that he can rule and reign. That's their plan. Where did they get that from? You see, because I'm looking at Mary sitting on the throne. And it just, it just doesn't seem right to me. Why is she sitting on the throne of God? Why is she sitting there? Because actually, in fact, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 20. Let's look at the, what the Bible says. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat. Notice this, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. That's the Ark of the Covenant. Yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of, of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is uh, worship, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So we, we see ultimately... That it's the Antichrist sitting on the throne of God. Not Mary. What is she doing there? And then it just hit me like a ton of bricks. This is what's going on. You see, when we study the Bible and we examine the scripture, God gives us light. He shows us what's really going on out in the world. You can look at Time Magazine and try to figure it out and you won't get it. You read the word of God, however, and you will. This mystery Babylon, this harlot woman, this queen of heaven, is represented by several people in the scripture. In one case in particular, she's represented by a woman named Jezebel. You know her, don't you? you probably, she probably goes to church with you. Okay. Anyway, 1 Kings chapter 21, I want you to understand this. 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 1, let me tell you the story. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spoke unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, uh, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Let me explain what's happening here. Here Ahab, he's, the, he's a wicked king, okay? And he's married to Jezebel, okay? And Ahab wants the vineyard. Think about that, the vineyard. There's even a whole denominational group called the Vineyard Movement. You know who they are? They're like the New Apostolic Reformation, the Signs and Wonders, Charismatics, the Joel's Army. You get what I'm saying? Okay? The Vineyard Movement. The vineyard represents the inheritance. It represents God's gift. It represents, uh, this is who I, what I received from my father, and I'm never to sell it. The law said you're never to sell your inheritance. Ahab wants that. He wants the throne. He wants that land. He wants heaven. He wants that. And Ahab wants this. And Naboth said, I can't give it to you, Ahab. It's against the law. I know you're the king, but not even the king is above the law. I cannot sell you my vineyard. I cannot give it away. I cannot trade it away for something better. This is my inheritance, and I'm going to stand for my inheritance. So Ahab, he just kind of crawled away and went crying. Now, 1 Kings 21, verse 4, and Ahab came into his house, having displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken unto him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? 
And he said unto her, Because I have spoken to Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. Uh, I wanted that vineyard. So Jezebel's going, Oh, good grief. Would you grow up? See, I think she despised him. I really do. And so look at 1 Kings 21, verse 7. Don't you listen to this. This is... This is, uh, where'd she go? Okay. This is, this is what she's doing on that ark. This is why she's sitting on it. This is why she has taken it over. But you look at this. Because Jezebel, Mystery of Babylon, she has a function. She has a role to play in the whole New World Order thing. You cannot, you cannot dismiss her because she is crucial to this thing. Look at what Jezebel said. Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou not govern the land, the kingdom of Israel? Arise, and eat bread, and let thy heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. We know according to Bible prophecy, we know according to scripture, that Satan said in Isaiah 14, he said, I will be like the Most High, I will sit in God's throne, Ezekiel 28. I'm going to sit in God's seat where God sits in the midst of the seas. Second Thessalonians 2, He as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing Himself that He is God. We know, according to Bible prophecy, that the goal is to take custody of the throne of God. How is that going to happen? She's going to get it for him. That's how it works. So you stop and think about this, okay? Dominion theology says, we the church, the woman, we're going to take over the whole world by hook or by crook. We're going to take, take over the branches of government. We're going to take over the banking institutions. We're going we're to restore this to the kingdom of God. Bless God. And they oh, sound real religious. And, oh, yeah, that's what God wants us to do. And so the whole dominion theology and the Vatican is behind every bit of that. Rick Joyner, he's a Knights of Malta. Go look that up. It's a Catholic organization. Rick Joyner and Todd Bentley and the whole lot of them and Joel's army, all about dominion theology. The, the Mormon church, about dominion theology, about taking over everything so we can hand it over to Christ so he can return and reign one of these days. Are you kidding me? It's about Jezebel saying, if you can't get it, Ahab, I'll get it for you. Jezebel didn't want the vineyard. Her role and her job was to take it over so that her husband could have it. Do you get it now? You understand? You understand now why she's sitting here. This is the Catholic's way of showing. This is the Vatican. This is the devil's way of showing you. Mystery Babylon, her way of showing you. We're going to take it all over. We're going to own every bit of it. And nobody is going to stand in our way, including you righteous fundamentalist people who believe the King James Bible. We will destroy. You know what they did with Naboth? She had him destroyed. We will destroy every one of you and we will take this over because Lucifer wants that throne to give it to the son, the child of the devil, the Antichrist himself. That's what this is all about. Okay? And you know what? You want to keep reading these, these uh, perversions of the Bible? You go right on ahead. You want to join the Masonic Lodge? You go right on ahead. You want to join all the cults, the Mormons... Uh, everybody else, the New Age movement, Seventh-day Adventist people, you want to join all that stuff, you just be my guest. Okay? I'm going to stand on the side of the Bible and I'm going to resist that. I'm going to resist that unto death and I'm not backing down. I'm not giving up. God will have to take me out of this world or the, you'll just have to take my life. But I'm not selling nor am I giving away the vineyard. Not without a fight. The Dominion Theology people and the World Banking, that's why, that's why that priest said, you know, with the financial system such a mess. We really need the Virgin Mary now to come and take over this. And did you, did, now you understand why he said that. It's going to be her job to take over the banking system of the world so she can give it to him. It's her job to take over the religious movements, including all the Christian churches. Why? So she can give it to him. Her job to take over all the nations of the world. Why? So she can give it to him. So now he can rule. If you're in dominion theology, get out of it. Get in the King James Bible 
and get your head on straight and quit sending money to these clowns. Quit following them. They're leading you into deception. All right, I think now I'm done with the Queen of Heaven for a while. All right, I've actually got more here to talk about, but we're out of time. God bless you. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. Thank you so much for praying for us. Keep us in your prayers. Will you stand with us? Will you pray with us? Will you help us? God bless you. Bye-bye.